Hello investigators and welcome to Until the End of Time. My name is Veronica and thank you for joining me. This is the update video for the start of August and I wasn't even expecting to do this video this quickly but yesterday was a wild ride of Arkham previews so I've got a lot of cards to be talking about with you today. There are six cards that I'm going to be describing in depth in this video and on top of that yesterday Maxine jumped onto the in-flight report and revealed the full information for Kaimani Jones. Now, I want to do a Kaimani Jones deep dive, but this video is probably already going to be quite long because there are two customizable cards for me to talk about. So I've decided to shelve that for later this week, especially because I know that at time of recording tomorrow, we are getting another preview card that is most likely the upgraded Thieves kit previewed by playing board games. So it will be nice to have that one in the video as well. As a quick refresher, Kamani Jones is the rogue for the Scarlet Keys expansion, and they are the security consultants. They are criminal traded. They have three willpower, two intellect, two combat, five agility, have a free trigger to engage an exhausted enemy, and a reaction when you attempt to evade an exhausted non-elite enemy. Add your intellect to your skill value for this attempt. If you succeed by at least X, discarded enemy acts that enemy's remaining health. An Elder Sign effect, plus one. If there's an exhausted enemy at your location, you automatically succeed instead. Eight health and six sanity. Now, I already talked about Kamani a little bit in a previous video. There's a link in the top right corner if you want to watch it. But let's talk about their deck building, which I didn't know at the time of making that previous video. And I'll be going into much more depth in the next video. So their deck building, deck size of 30, which is pretty standard. Deck building options are rogue cards, zero to five. Tool cards 0 to 4 and neutral cards 0 to 5. I must admit to not seeing the tools coming, but it's a pretty neat option. There's a couple of pretty cool cards there. And their deck building requirements are Grappling Hook, Agent Fletcher, and a random basic weakness. And on top of all that, they also begin with 5 additional experience, just like Father Matteo and the Parallel Roland. Their signatures are also now known, also revealed by Maxine. The Grappling Hook is a three cost asset with intellect, agility, and wild icons, item and tool traded, and they takes up a single hand slot. It reads, Kamani Jones deck only. Action performed using Grappling Hook do not provoke attacks of opportunity. Action, action, exhaust Grappling Hook. Take up the three different basic actions from the following list in any order. Engage evade, investigate, or move. If you investigate, use your agility instead of your intellect. This seems like a fantastic signature asset. You put this down and you basically get a bonus action, but only if you're willing to take three different actions from that list. That being said, even if you're just spending two actions to move and investigate, the fact that you get to investigate using your agility instead of your intellect is a big draw for the Thieves kit, and now maybe you can skip out on that one. I think this is a cool signature asset and I really look forward to seeing how people play with this. Agent Fletcher is a weakness enemy, prey Kamani Jones only with alert and hunter. While Kamani Jones is evading Agent Fletcher, reduce their intellect value to zero. And they have two fight, three health, three evade and deal one damage and one horror. So Agent Fletcher is a little bit hard to deal with with Kamani's special signature move, but having only two combat and three agility means you are able to deal with them in other ways. And um, it's worth noting that he, uh, that Agent Fletcher has the humanoid coterie and detective traits. So uh, they are a member of the coterie that we know are antagonists, question mark, in the Scarlet Keys. I look forward to seeing what this is all about. It looks pretty manageable. Three health enemies can be a bit rough, but I think Kamani has got to be good enough that this won't be a major deal breaker. All right, we're moving on to the Raven Quill, the first of two customizable cards I'll be discussing. And this one was previewed by Playing Board Games. It is a Seeker event for three resources with two intellect icons. It is importantly unique, which means you can only have one of these in play at a time across the entire table. It has the item, relic and upgrade traits, which are unusual traits for an event, but makes sense, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual quill. Um, and then it has some pretty wild text. Customizable, when you purchase the Raven Quill, name a tome or spell asset and record that name 
on its upgrade sheet. So this is where having that upgrade sheet just makes so many more things possible. So this upgrade only applies to a single named tome or spell asset. There are a couple of ways to like finick with that, but short version is you have to pick which tome this is or spell this is upgrading because then you can only attach this to the name asset you control when you play it. And then it has a reaction ability when you resign or the game ends, either mark a checkbox on the Raven Quills upgrade sheet or reduce the experience cost to upgrade the attached asset before the next scenario by one. So by default, this card doesn't do much. The only thing that it gives you is a small XP discount. Paying three resources for one XP is actually not even the worst. Um, it's not like an XP engine or anything, but you could name Old Book of Lore and then attach this to your Old Book of Lore for three resources, at which point at the end of the game, you could upgrade it from the level zero version to the level three version, paying only two experience. That's, you know, it's pretty nice. Yeah, I, I, it's not wild about it, but you know, there are a whole bunch of upgrade sheets and we can also, and that's important, assuming that you play this card and attach it during the game, you get to also alternatively check one of those boxes for free. So keep in mind that all the upgrades we're about to talk about, they have an XP cost, but you might be able to get them for free as well. And so the first upgrade is Living Quill. Living Quill reads, using the attached assets action abilities does not provoke attacks of opportunity. I think this is a pretty neat ability. Obviously, you try not to use action abilities on thumbs that much while you're engaged with enemies anyway, because enemies bad. So I don't find myself often having this problem, but I did recently play the Other World Codex, a tome from the Dream Eaters campaign, which has the ability to discard uh, treacheries or enemies from the encounter or from sorry from play if you can find another copy of them in the top of the encounter deck and multiple times over the course of that game i had to take an attack of opportunity from an enemy engaged with me to find another copy of that enemy from the encounter deck and discard the enemy engaged with me having this upgrade to make it no longer attack me is actually pretty nice and i would like that upgrade so yeah would have to name the other world codex of course for that which i don't know how many of the other abilities are worth it for that but we'll have to see Next up, we have a spectral uh, binding. Attacked asset does not take up any slots. I think this might be one of the best upgrades on this entire sheet, and that might sound a little weird, but I'm keeping in, to, uh, keeping in mind that also I'm counting that as this is only a one XP upgrade, so it's very easy to get in there. It's very cheap, relatively speaking. And the fact is that there aren't a lot of cards in the game that make just give you additional slots. There are plenty of cards that trade one slot for another, right? Uh, the Book of Shadows or Sign Magic or Arcane Enlightenment lets you trade one kind of slot for a different kind of slot, which is a powerful thing, but there's not a lot of assets that let you just, or cards that give you just another slot of any kind, right? And the ones that do, like Charisma, are pretty highly praised. And this just lets you get one more typically hand slot, although it also works on spells, so it could also be another Arcane slot for you to play with on top of everything else. Now, three cost is expensive, but having the ability to run with more tomes is really good. So yeah, I, I think this is a very strong ability relative to the fact that it only costs one XP. Obviously the, the higher XP upgrades are more impactful, but they also cost more. Next up, we have Mystic Vein. You get plus two skill value while performing skill tests on the attached asset. There are not a lot of domes that have skill tests on them. I think medical texts might be the only one. Uh, but that doesn't mean that this is not a useful upgrade for medical text or in fact all those spells because this is a tome or spell asset uh, that you can attach this to and getting a plus two on any uh, spell asset that you've named with this seems pretty good. Of course, you are limited to a single named asset, so it's not that flexible. You really got to pick your poison unless you get the endless inkwell upgrade, which lets you name two more tome or spell assets. So this way, we can pick a whole bunch of different uh, spells or different tomes and have a little yeah, set without any of the other upgrades. This just gives you more experience and actually seems like potentially a kind of fun upgrading path pattern for an entire campaign, right? You start out naming, say, Shriveling, and then you upgrade that with the Raven Quill discount when you've got it in play at the end of the game. And then once you've run out of Shriveling upgrades, you use the ability to get the free ticks on Endless Inkwell, 
at which point you start upgrading whatever other cards you name. That works better in campaigns that have a lot of scenarios. Um, thinking of Edge of the Earth, and I think Forgotten Age has an extra scenario here and there as well. But it also works very well with Down the Rabbit Hole, the Mystic Permanent from Edge of the Earth, which reduces the cost of upgrades. Stacking that with the Raven Quill seems quite nice. You get a lot of free XP upgrading your toolkit. Next up we have Energy Sap, another very powerful ability that lets you uh, that gives the Raven Quill a new ability, free trigger and exhaust the Raven Quill, move one secret or charge from an asset you control to the attached asset. So this is a very powerful ability if it is attached to a very powerful tome or spell that can use more charges or more secrets. And one that specifically came to mind for me is the Narcotic Manuscripts. I really like that card, but it is really held back by the fact that it only gets three uses. Now, each of those uses means that you can potentially have a skill test where you don't have to reveal any Chaos Tokens, which is obviously a very powerful ability, but only getting three secrets for five cost is very expensive. However, with the Raven Quill, we can use secrets from a card like Forbidden Knowledge or the Schaffner's Catalog, which are very cheap, zero XP cards that have a lot of secrets on them to power up narcotic manuscripts. So I really like this card, I really, or really like this upgrade. I really think it's gonna enable some cool strategies. For charges, I'm a little unsure what a good charge battery would be. There's not a lot of spells that come in with a lot of charges that are very cheap. I can only think of a couple, but I am thinking that there are a couple of other assets like the skull, the crystal skull. I don't quite remember what it's called. The one that from Forgotten Age, that whenever something dies, you get a charge on it. That one might work with this as well. So I think there's a lot of utility here, and I think people should really experiment with this upgrade. The next one is Interwoven Ink. After you resolve an action ability on the attached asset, you may exhaust the Raven Quill to ready another asset you control. Now note, because this exhausts and the energy stop exhausts, you're only probably going to want to get one of those two, not both. This upgrade seems fantastic, seems very strong. Basically, you get a free ready on any asset you control once per turn, assuming you can activate that action ability every turn. Now, if you're Daisy and you have an old book of lore, I'm pretty sure most of you will have played that deck at some point because it's just like such an Arkham classic. You're just gonna have old book of lore Daisy and you're just going to get a free ready every single turn of the game. That's so good, that's fantastic. So it's not even restricted to like another Tome asset, another spell set, you just anything, right? Allies, uh, Covenants, if you're doing Blast and Curse stuff. I, I literally haven't figured out all the best synergies because there are so many things you can do when you can ready any asset in the game. It has to be another asset, so note that it can't ready itself, but there's a lot you can do with this. And then finally, we have Supernatural Record which is a four XP upgrade or four box upgrade. When you play the Raven Quill, instead of attaching it to the name asset, you may search your deck, discard pile and hand for a copy of the name asset and play it, then attach the Raven Quill to it. And you do have to pay the cost when you do that. So this seems like an interesting upgrade when you have one very powerful tome in your deck. The Necronomicon comes to mind because it's a limit one per deck because this becomes a tutor, right? You can have two copies of the Raven Quill in your deck and they become search facts that let you find your most powerful upgrade. I like that. I think it's a bit expensive and especially in Seeker who have very good uh, card draw already. I'm not sure if it's strictly necessary, but Supernatural Record plus the Inkwell, which gives you three potential assets that you could be finding with this might be worth it just to have a little bit of flexibility with the tutor as well and in general i think this card has a lot of good uses as well as generally just a high power level especially given that you will be getting some of these upgrades for free so yeah this slots in perfectly in that classic seeker style of tomes and a little bit of magic as well like spells obviously a very mystic thing so if you're off class mystic or maybe you're a, someone like luke who can take main class uh, Mystic and an off-class Seeker. I think this card is worth looking at because it's very, very good. Moving on, we have Hit and Run, previewed by Winging It. Oh, before I forget to mention, all of the links to all the previews of these, of course, will be in the description below. Now, Hit and Run is a zero XP, one cost rogue event, combat and agility icons. It is a tactic and trick, which means that Rita and Mark can take it. And it reads fast, play only during your turn. Put an ally asset from your hand into play. At the end of your turn, if that asset is still in play, 
return it to your hand. Impeccable timing, Mr. Fergus. So this is Sleight of Friend. If you're familiar with the card Sleight of Hand, this does the same thing, but with an ally. So you can put an ally into play, they stay there and they don't cost their money to play, right? You pay one for hit and run, but that's it. And then at the end of the turn, they go back to hand. The most powerful combinations with this are any ally that have a powerful enter play effect. So art student discovers a clue, medical student can heal you. I've been doing this in Mark actually, playing medical students over and over again to get lots of healing. And sometimes you soak with the medical student because you know, they gotta die, sorry. Um, but another very powerful combo is calling in favors because you can put in a very expensive ally with hit and run, use their ability, and then calling in favors them before they would be returned to hand with the hit and run ability. And that way you get to search your deck for another ally and cost reduce it by the real cost of the ally you put into play for free, which is pretty powerful. I, I haven't really figured out how to make that a consistent deck, but it seems very fun at least. Finally, I, I did mention, or I did want to mention Gregory Gry. I haven't played Gry with Hit and Run yet, but it seems kind of cool to put in Gregory Gry for free and then try to get as much money out of him as quick as possible before he goes back to hand, at which point you can use the money you just got from him to put him into play for real and repeat the process. So that seems like a good way to get rich. I think this is a pretty effective card. Obviously, Charlie Kane is going to like it. He's the ally guy. But in general, it just seems kind of solid, right? Allies are good. Just make sure you have allies that benefit coming into play and then doing a thing and then going away again. Because if you're just using it to put like, I don't know, a soak ally or something into play, that's not really going to be worth it. Next up, we have the Tool Delve, previewed by Drawn to the Flame. It is a two cost, zero XP neutral asset with a willpower icon, item and clothing trade. Each attached asset takes up no slots and its text Text box, is breed, uh, text box is treated as if it were blank, except for traits. Free trigger, exhaust tool belt, choose one, attach a tool asset in your play area to tool belt, switch a tool asset in your play area with an attached asset, or detach an attached asset. It takes up a body slot. So this is a body slot asset that can take any amount of tool assets. There's no limit on the number of cards you can attach to this, but any assets that are attached don't do anything. They're just blank and they have no they take, take up no slots. So this is a very interesting card. I'm going to be talking a lot more about tools in the upcoming Kamani video. So, you know, stay tuned for that one. I, I won't go into too deep on this one right now. But what I think is kind of crucial to talk about is there is this kind of level of too many assets. And you see this a lot with Bandelier decks, right? Any deck that wants Bandelier is already running a bunch of assets because they're running enough weapons that it's going to be a problem. And so I think tool belt is probably the same where if you're playing a whole lot of tools to the point where you feel like tool belt is a good inclusion, you're now running a lot of assets. But on the other hand, I think tool decks are more likely to be scavenging decks because a lot of tools work very well with scavenging and a lot of the tools are in survivor. So that makes me think that it's a little bit easier to have a lot of assets and then get them back out of this card pile, do shenanigans with them. So I'm a little bit more inclined to think that a tool belt deck that runs a lot of assets is less likely to run into those issues, but you still have to be very aware that a deck that runs a lot of assets can be kind of slow and clunky. The other thing is, I think for this card to be worthwhile, you really have to be using bigger assets, ones that take up multiple slots like Chainsaw, or assets that you don't need except in very specific circumstances. One of the things I'm thinking about is the Ice Pick deck, probably wants this to hide the ice picks under whenever it can scavenge one back. So it can scavenge both the ice picks back, put them safely under tool belt. And then whenever it's time to crack out those extra deductions or maybe extra vicious blows, you can pull those out from under there and use them. And the fact that it's exhaust, and so you can only put in one or take one out or both, but only one per turn is kind of tricky. I think you're gonna have to be careful managing that because I think it's very easy to end up in a situation where you have a tool belt with four tools underneath it and then you're gonna have three turns where most of those cards don't do anything. And that's not really a good way to win a game of Arkham. And then next up, the second customizable card of the day, it's also Seeker. It is a two cost event with a single intellect icon, talent and science traded, customizable limit one per investigator, forced. At the start of the round, choose one of the following criteria for this round. You fill a test by two or more, or you succeed a test by two, three or more, sorry, not two or more, three or more. 
When the chosen criteria is met, you may exhaust empirical hypothesis to add one evidence to it, and then a free trigger, spend one evidence to draw one card. There's no limit on that last one. So if you have a bunch of evidence sitting on this, you can just spend it all and draw a whole bunch of cards. I think this card is already quite strong without taking the whole customizable thing into account. Because simply put, succeeding at a test by three or more or failing a test by two or less or two or more, whichever one you're more likely to do in a turn, isn't that hard to set up, at which point you just draw an extra card every turn. We've seen with cards like Lucky Cigarette Case how powerful just getting an extra card every turn is. Lucky Cigarette Case literally, I think, was the reason this, the Rogue class became got like played because it was so good to get all those cards and go through your deck very quickly. And this just is a slotless Lucky Cigarette Case in a, in a sense. Obviously, it's a little harder, but it's also not that hard and Customizable is going to add a lot more to this card. The two investigators I think that stand out the most to me, uh, Min is not going to have any problem succeeding at a test by three or more. She wants to run lots of skill cards to commit to tests. Those are going to make her succeed a lot more than usual. And then you can use this to refill so you can get more skills, especially if you need to clear the king in yellow. Meanwhile, Harvey is, of course, the guy who gets a bonus draw whenever you draw during the investigation phase. So using empirical, uh, empirical hypothesis to trigger that seems very good. It doubles up the efficiency of your evidence. So yeah, I'm already quite high on this card. And let's talk about the upgrades, starting with the last one, because I think it will help if we start with alternative hypothesis and then work our way to the top. Normally I start there, but this is a four XP upgrade. After you exhaust empirical hypothesis, you may resolve its force effect choosing a criteria you have not chosen this round, then ready it. So the way this works, at least the way I think it's supposed to work is you can choose a different criteria every time. And then if you can complete that one, you can use it again. Now, the way it's worded actually doesn't say that you can't use the first criteria again, but I think it's kind of implied that you're, you, you need to pick the different one. So for example, if you already succeeded the test by three or more, you now need to fill a test or two by two or more. Succeeding again by three or more shouldn't give you another evidence, I think. So at a baseline, this doubles up your evidence, assuming you can both succeed and fill a test in the right order, because that's important. Once you've locked in your effect, your criteria, you need to do that before you can do the next one. You can't just go, I'll get whichever one is convenient first and then try the other one. No, you have to sequence them. However, there's no limit on the number of criteria you can choose in a round, except for the fact that you can choose each one once, which means that if we have more than two criteria, guess what some of the other upgrades are going to be, we can do this a lot of times. And looking at the other criteria, We've got four extra options for a total of potentially six criteria. Each one costs one XP and they have pessimistic outlook and the following criteria, you run out of cards in your hand. So if you ever have zero cards in hand, you can trigger this one. Trial and error, you are dealt damage or horror. Independent variable, you discard a treachery or enemy from play. And field research, you enter a location with three or more shroud. Out of these, I think that field research is probably the best one in most seekers, especially when you're talking about characters like Ursula Downs or Monterey Jack, because they like moving a lot and there's a lot of movement in seeker. So with a card like Pathfinder, it'll be very easy to trigger this every single round, right? You might start with this one and then assuming you have the alternative uh, hypothesis, you then pick whichever one else, you, whichever other one you think you can manage. But I think the other ones are also pretty good. Forbidden Knowledge, uh, sorry, Trial and Error works very well with cards like Forbidden Knowledge, which lets you take damage or horror on command, which is very important. I think if you're trying to like guess if you can get a damage or horror, it's going to be kind of tricky. You might get stuck with this not doing anything. But if you have cards that guarantee you'll take damage or horror, that's very good. Pessimistic Outlook is a bit tricky, but the fact that this is a free trigger and not kind of like a reaction or anything where you have to draw the cards means that you could save cards on the hypothesis go empty handed for a couple of rounds to build up evidence and then power, draw a whole bunch of cards and finish the scenario that way. And finally, independent variable is, yeah, that seems like it's gonna happen most turns, right? Keep in mind that it has to be a treacherous enemy that's in play. So if you have a card like Rotting Remains that just is a revelation test and then discards, those I think don't ever end up 
in play, so that wouldn't trigger independent variable, but cards like Obscuring Fog or Locked Door and most enemies are going to end up in play, at which point discarding them or defeating them will get you your evidence. And then next up we have Peer Review, which I think is my favorite of these bunch. The chosen criteria is met if any investigator at your location meets it instead of only you. Other investigators at your location may trigger the free triggered ability abilities sorry, on empirical hypothesis. So this turns it from kind of a weird mini game that you have to play to kind of a weird mini game that your entire team gets to play. Looking back at the four upgrades we just talked about, it becomes a lot more doable to have all four of these trigger in a round if you can share them with your team, right? One person is going to fill that test one person is going to pass a test by three or more. One person is going to take some damage. One person is going to move in. It's a lot of work, but if you can divide it over your three or four player group, it's going to be very easy to have all of that happen. And then we have a couple more free triggers that we can use to spend the evidence on different things. The research grant gives you the ability to spend two evidence to reduce the cost of the next card you play this phase by three. I really like this upgrade. I think it's quite good. Um, one of the things that you can kind of fall into is because most economy takes actions to play, you can get kind of bogged down if you're drawing a lot of cards and you don't have a, a lot of fast economy because you have to spend actions to play your economy cards to then be able to play all the other cards you're drawing. This solves that. Two evidence is a lot. Those two evidence could have been two other cards. But if you have enough cards in hand that that's not really a problem and you just want to play stuff, this is a fantastic upgrade. On the other hand, Irrefutable Proof, a 3 XP upgrade, I think is a lot less good. For 3 evidence, you can discover one clue at your location. Now, that's not to say that testless clues aren't good. In fact, they're fantastic. But the problem that I'm having with it is, if you're a seeker who can take you know, higher XP seeker cards, and you have 3 evidence on this, just draw 3 cards and you'll find a way to get that clue, right? I think... There are situations imaginable where this card is good or where this ability is good, but a lot of the times you could also just put cards like Working Hunch in your deck, and those are also good in those circumstances. And then you don't have to spend 3 XP on this upgrade. I'm not saying this upgrade is terrible, but I'm just saying compared to everything else, uh, I'm kind of. It feels <laughs> weirdly balanced. I think making automatic clue discovery expensive is good, but making card draw very cheap is already the ship has already sailed for me on that one like this cost it, there's a weird cost in that one anyway i think the most excited i am for this card is a 10 xp build so it's going to be your full 10 xp probably taking up the most most of your deck space uh, xp early on but getting trial and error field research peer review research grant and alternative hypothesis which means that we have four different criteria you could swap out trial and error for independent variable if you think that one's more likely to trigger. And then you, you and your entire team can try to trigger them and you can spend those to get card draw and economy. And I think it's pretty likely that you'll get like three criteria every single turn, which means that this is basically like playing cryptic research every turn. I think this card is really powerful. Honestly, I think it's probably a little bit too powerful, but we'll have to see. I think, I mean... It's, it's fun, right? I think that's one of the things for me. It's like, it's playing this fun little mini game, which changes what you're prioritizing in a game. And insofar that you can do that and still have fun and then draw a couple of cards, like that's fine. I think it's probably more fuel on the Seeker Bonfire, but yeah, whatever. I mean, that, that ship has kind of sailed. I don't know. It's probably fine. Next up, we have Ghastly Possession, previewed by Optimal Play. This is a 1 XP Mystic skill card with a single wild icon. It is innate and spell traded. Innate is important, means Silas can take it. And after you commit Ghastly Possession to a skill test on an asset, choose one. Place one Doom on that asset, Ghastly Possession gains two wild icons. Or if this test is successful, either remove one Doom from that asset or replenish half of its uses rounded down. I think this card is a fantastic bit in the tool in the Doom Manipulation Toolkit. So I've actually been playing a bit of Amani, and I've also been playing Marie recently, and I think both of them very much like this card, and the fact that it's 1xp means it slides into both of them quite early on, which is nice. For Marie, the fact that you can put a Doom on an asset whenever you perform a skill test means that her uh, bonus action is a little bit easier to trigger, because I've actually found that that one can be a bit tricky if you don't build around it. 
Whereas the ability to remove Doom from your assets is very necessary if that's getting out of control. So having an extra safety valve there is very useful. I think in general, the most powerful mode on this, however, is replenishing half the uses. This becomes kind of a recharge style card. And the fact that it doesn't say charges or anything like that, and it isn't restricted to, a, to an asset you control, means that you can potentially use this to refuel your teammates' assets as well. This is more relevant for Silas, who can take this, than it is for, I think, anybody else, because most mystics will probably have spells they want to recharge with this. But still, it's worth noting that if your teammate has a flamethrower, you can just throw this to them and give them back some extra ammo. I think replenish means it can't go over the normal max, but we haven't really seen any rules about replenish yet, so we'll have to see. And then finally, last card, very, very uh, good, is Calculated Risk by The Whisper in Darkness. It is a 0 XP rogue skill without skill icons, has Gambit and Faded traded, max 1 committed per test, commit only to a test you are performing of any type and only if it is your turn. Calculated Risk gains Wild Icon for each action you perform this turn, including this one, after this test ends, and your turn. So this card is sort of inverse Take the Initiative. Take the Initiative Guardian skill with three icons that gets fewer icons as actions are performed, which makes Calculated Risk interesting because it is not a uh, treachery protection card, at least not most treacheries, but it is quite good at giving you a very powerful last action. In a sense, it's kind of like Payday. Payday is also, you get a bunch of resources at the end of your turn for each action you've performed. So if you've had a good turn, you get a money rebate. But for this card, it's more like you can have that big investigate or maybe a big firearm uh, test at the end of your turn, but you have to kind of sequence it so that it will end your turn because otherwise you're wasting your actions. One of particular note is be careful if you're playing Daredevil and this card. If you're taking a test during your turn and you Daredevil and you hit this, it's gonna end your turn whether you like it or not. You don't get an option to not commit that card. But you can easily mitigate that by only using Daredevil outside of your turn or only as the last action anyway. That way you're pretty safe. And I think this card has some great meme potential. Just had to bring it up. It's just really funny. I'm imagining the situation where somebody with the shotgun makes sure that they are exactly lost action to walk into the room and shoot the guy and then out of fail. So yeah, uh, I look forward to seeing some memes. If you have some fantastic meme plays with calculated risk, let me know. Uh, finally, a quick one on Frozen and Fear. So recent FAQ update, or at least a like, question asked to uh, FFG is that Tests that are at the end of your turn are still considered to be part of your turn. So Calculated Risk should be able to be committed to Frozen in Fear, but keep an eye out, that might change, that might not be entirely correct. I think it is correct, but you know, check the FAQ, we're expecting an upgrade very, update very soon. And one thing to specifically note there is that additional actions and double action abilities are considered one action you're performing, which in this case would mean if you're Frozen in Fear, and you do, say, a fight action, which costs two actions because of the Frozen Affair, that actually only counts as a single action for Calculated Risk. That sounds weird, but basically the way you're to think of it is the game is trying to check for each ability you've taken in the game, and turning it from a single action cost into a double action cost doesn't increase the number of abilities you've activated. So try to be careful... I think Frozen and Fear, I think Calculated Risk is a fantastic Frozen and Fear uh, utility bit. And because it's a zero XP rogue card, you can always adaptable it in. So that seems very good, right? You just get, whenever you know that there's Frozen and Fear in the next scenario, you just put these in and then you have an out. Try to take three or four actions and most rogues can do that, right? Skids, Finn, Tony all get bonus actions, which can easily make this a three or four wild icon card, which is a lot of value out of a level zero skill card. And Winifred, I think, wants to be running more skills anyway because she wants to trigger her ability. This is a good include and I think might even take the place of some of the other cards she'd been running before this because having a big test on the last action is very nice. And that's it. That's six cards. Uh, please keep an eye out for the Kaimani video coming very, very soon, hopefully. Please uh, check out the Discord. Please check out my other videos please if you like the video like and subscribe like i don't usually do this calls or action but i've been like i've spent my entire day making this video i think it's probably six hours or more of work uh so i hope you enjoy it 
Thank you very much for watching and I'll be seeing you until the end of time.